All right, so I'm Jessica Shade. I'm the Director of Science Programs for the Organic Center. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project that we're collaborating on with Harvard University that looks at the impacts of organic management on greenhouse gas emissions. And first, I'm going to give you a summary of what we were trying to do and then what we actually found out. Um, and then I'm going to go back to the beginning and kind of take you through our process. So, okay. All right, so what we were looking for was to understand what aspects of organic food production were contributing the most to climate change mitigation. And what we actually found was that the biggest areas of impact, so what we found the biggest areas of impact were, were carbon sequestration, no surprise, right? Um, they weren't even included in the large life cycle inventory that we used because a lot of the life cycle inventories that are out there are really focused around conventional agriculture unit processes. So which means that a lot of industry level LCAs that we see might be completely inaccurate for organic crops. So it's kind of a project that we had an initial goal for, but then we found out something even more interesting. Um, but let's go back to the beginning. What's LCA? Life cycle analysis. Thank you so much for reminding me to not just use abbreviations. I feel like sometimes I speak entire paragraphs in abbreviations, so shout it out if I'm doing that. Um, so what we were trying to do was understand the areas of climate mitigation that organic practices were excelling at so that we can leverage those while improving or reducing aspects of organic that are contributing more to climate change. And we worked with the Sustainability and in Health Initiative for Net Positive Enterprise, abbreviation SHINE, um, team at Harvard University. And they specialize in this um, positive sustainability approach. So they call it net positives. And all that it is, is it incorporates reducing the negative impacts on the environment while bolstering positive impacts. It's a pretty simple concept. Um, and their research team has worked across a lot of industries and sectors before, but they've never worked with organic. And I love collaborating with labs that haven't done work on organic systems before, but because it gives us both this fresh perspective on how to look at things. So we were using a traditional process life cycle analysis approach because we wanted to get a big picture view of what was going on from the cradle to the grave. And I had some background slides here on what a life cycle analysis is. That's when I say LCA, life cycle analysis, um, and all the stages of modeling, but it was way too long and I was going way over my 15 minutes. So basically all you need to know for this presentation is that an LCA is a full process chain analysis that examines the impact of a product in a particular impact category. Um, and in this case, our flow model is looking at greenhouse gas emissions. So we're focusing on climate change mitigation. Um, and one of the things that um, I wanted to mention is there are some really cool softwares out there for collecting and improving on-farm climate impacts like the cool farm tool or um, Comet Farm. And I know that some of the people who, at least some of the people who were in this room, are actually working to help improve those for organic systems. But we're using data from the EcoInvent database. And this is one of the biggest suppliers of life cycle inventory data out there. Um, it's the database that I see most commonly when I'm reading about life cycle analyses. And they have around like 15,000 data sets in a bunch of different areas. So it's this very large database. Um, and the team at Harvard that we're working it with is really sold on it. It's their go-to. They've worked with it on a bunch, a bunch of different times. It's really comprehensive in modeling impacts across the full supply chain of farms. Um, it also enables the I don't want to say mass production of life cycle analysis. It's, it more makes it more accessible outside of academia um, because the data is 
already collected in one place, it's already validated, um, and they even group them for you by product, which can allow people to shortcut some of the processes. So like the inventory analysis and even the scope and definition of the life cycle analysis. But trusting these databases can also come with some misleading results. Um, so it's kind of this trade-off. And one of the things that I like about the EcoInvent database is that it's completely transparent. So you can look at the full methodological framework. So if you're interested, you can follow how the data is implemented, where it comes from, which means that you can add to it in a way that will improve your life cycle analysis if you need to. That's me foreshadowing. All right, so we looked at 10 different crops. Um, and to be frank, the reason we chose these crops is this is what there was data for. There still isn't a lot of data for organic out there. So we used what was available already. Um, and we used conventional as a control to understand how using organic techniques alters the impacts on the climate. So this is just a quick snapshot of some of the unit processes that we were looking at. You do not need to read all this. It comes from our flow model. I'm gonna group, group these by processes. Uh, I'm gonna group these processes by context in two slides from now. Just know that we're looking at everything from fertilizer to tillage to transportation, et cetera. Um, so these are our initial results. Um, the impact category, so what we were looking at and what's on this vertical axis is carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram crop harvested. So we weren't just looking at CO2, but um, we converted everything so that it's comparable. And we looked at per kilogram of crop harvested rather than per acre. So that's something to keep in mind while you're looking at this. And since organic crops tend to have lower yields than conventional, we weren't too surprised by these results. Um, some crops showed that organic techniques could be advantageous when it comes to climate change mitigation. So hay, corn, um, canola, soy, wheat. And then others were more impacted by that yield reduction and showed that organic was less advantageous. So crops like barley, fava, peas, potatoes, rye. Um, but this comparison wasn't really what we were interested in. We wanted to look for patterns in the life cycle phases to see what areas within organic were really having the biggest benefit on climate change mitigation. And when we broke down the results into their life cycle phases to identify which aspects were making a major contribution to climate change, we found that on-farm emissions of nitrous oxide were playing the biggest role. So that was really what was dominating a lot of these impacts. So this is just one of the crops we looked at. For example, this is potatoes. Um, on the vertical axis, again, is kilograms of CO2 equivalent, and then we have these different colors that, um, I'm so bad with the pointer. Is it That's okay. No, I blocked it with my finger. That's all right. <laughs> you guys get what I'm saying. The, the different colors um, are, correlate with different aspects. So um, what we looked at are on-farm CO2 release, on farm nitrous oxide release, upstream nitrous oxide release, which is mostly from the creation of synthetic fertilizer for conventional, which is why you don't see that gray bar in the organic. Um, and we found that you can see the orange are those on farm emissions of nitrous oxide. They're playing the biggest role here. Is there error bars on that happens? So uh, there are error bars and I didn't include them because there's a huge amount of error. So take this all with a grain of salt. Okay, this is you. not an exact pinpointed analysis. That is a good point. Um, but one of the things that we noticed was that there weren't any differences between any of the organic nitrous oxide losses and the conventional nitrous oxide losses for any of the crops that we looked at which was weird since the variables that dominate nitrous oxide emissions like fertilizer practices are pretty different between organic and conventional. Um, and when we started digging in to the data, 
pen. You do not need to read this full uh, nitrogen cycle. I put it up there because it's pretty, but. Um, so when we started digging into the data and the data sources, we started to see all kinds of issues. So for those soil emission factors for nitrous oxide, the data set is based on emissions factors published by the IPCC back in 2001, um, which is obviously vastly out of date. But it also doesn't include the differences between organic and conventional production. And so we actually reached out to the researchers who were involved in updating the EcoInvent database for that section. And they confirmed that any differences between organic and conventional production in relation to soil emissions of nitrous oxide specifically hadn't been addressed in the database over the last 17 years, which is a pretty important thing to think about. So um, we updated them ourselves. We used a meta-analysis from Skinner et al. There's, if you want any of the citations or meta-analyses that I used, let me know. Um, they reviewed 12 studies with annual measurements, which included the crops that we were looking at, which was very lucky that in this instance, we actually found a meta-analysis that had all the information that we needed. We are not always that lucky. All right, so another thing that we noticed and many of you may have thought about this too when I was showing you that initial graph, is that everything that's included in that EcoInvent database was happening above the soil, and there wasn't any sequestration information. Now, that was in the system boundaries when we put together um, the scope and definition for this LCA, and the database did include carbon dioxide uptake in the harvested biomass, but they didn't include any organic matter shifts in the soil. So we reached out to some researchers who had measured this. Um, I haven't seen Michelle Cavagelli here. I don't think he's here. But he was a huge help. We used a lot of his data. Um, he spoke with us extensively, helping us do this, because we were not lucky enough to find a single meta-analysis that had all the information we needed for this one. Um, so we worked with researchers to estimate soil carbon fluxes per kilogram crop um, produced for each crop and production type. Um, we also checked the robustness of our findings with meta-analyses of soil carbon content under organic and conventional agriculture across soil types, climates, and crops. So here are the updated findings that take the new N2O data into account and include the carbon sequestration data. They're really different from the old findings. Um, we're writing the manuscript now, so we're still going through the data to make sure that we're not missing anything else. We're in this um, interpretation phase of the life cycle analysis. And again, you don't really need to absorb all these graphs. Uh, I have all the graphs in a follow-up slide if you're interested. Um, but here's a summary slide. <coughs> And the main takeaway is that the addition of carbon sequestration data has a big effect on the overall impact of these agricultural systems. And that for organic, it's the area that's having the biggest positive influence on climate change mitigation. So our findings for the original question were that when it comes to agriculture, the main benefits of organic techniques are in the ability of those systems to sequester carbon in the soil. Um, there's some benefits to reduced nitrous oxide emissions, especially upstream, which, like I mentioned, it's dominated in conventional agriculture by the production of synthetic nitrogen. But the carbon storage really has a much <coughs> bigger impact on those than the upstream processes. Um, but what we're hoping is that above all, these findings are also able to have an impact on future life cycle analyses that get done, especially in the industry world. In academia, people are doing things much more detailed. They're finding their own data. They're, they're developing their own um, flow charts and models. It's a little bit more detailed. But a lot of these life cycle analyses get done at this broader level using databases like the EcoInvent database. So. Um, Hopefully we're documenting the shortcomings of current databases in terms of information that's important for organic systems. Um, when life cycle analysis started taking off, people weren't really thinking about organic a lot. So these databases just 
didn't take the time to think about it. They didn't take the time to include that data to be able to have an accurate assessment of organic products. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that since organic has grown so quickly and organic has such a big focus on environment and health impact, these databases are getting used without people understanding their limitations and the results can end up being pretty skewed. Um, so what we really need is a full analysis of all the life cycle phases in organic production so we can figure out what's missing. Um, we stumbled upon a couple aspects here, but what else isn't there? And we're actually doing a follow-up study right now that looks at human health, and we realized that the, the database has really limited data on pesticides, and what it does include only has production information, so nothing on farmer use or impacts or residues on crops. So everywhere we look, there are holes in the data when it comes to organic. Um, and once we publish the study, we're going to have two communications campaigns. One on the original focus of the study, so communicating the positive areas where organic contributes to climate change. But we're also going to be communicating and targeting life cycle data set providers like EcoInvent, but others like um, the Global Feed LCI Institute or the US LCA Digital Commons. Um, and our goal is to get researchers who engage with these databases to help make data for organic products more robust and think systemically about what we might be missing when data gets compiled with conventional systems in mind. So thanks everyone. I find the your second round of um, calculations for sequestration interesting because there's been a long debate within organic agriculture about tillage. Yes. And it seems this also suggests that tillage is not the big bugaboo that people say it is because obviously if tillage was going on as significantly as some people claim, then you wouldn't get those numbers for carbon sequestration. How would you respond to that? Yes, so I think about this a lot. And one of the things that I actually just found out last year from reading a study that was, I don't know if any of you read Verena Sufert's study that came out, I think it was two years now ago now, there's a section on tillage. And she actually points out that if you look at the NAS data, so National Agriculture Statistics Service data, conservation tillage is used similar proportions in organic and conventional, which was huge news to me because you always hear about how organic uses a lot more tillage. That's not necessarily the case. Um, so I think that that's one aspect of this. Another is that if you look at, so this is one of the reasons we were talking with Michelle uh, Cavagelli, is that if you look beyond that first, I don't know, I forget, um, the depth that most of the, yeah. 30 uh, centimeters. 30 centimeters? 30 centimeters is what most of them. Okay, so if you look uh, beyond that, if you look deeper in the soil, organic, even if you're comparing organic with full tillage to conventional no-till, organic actually sequesters more carbon deeper in the soil. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about tillage. Um, so, uh, this this is you know a topic I definitely don't have the depth of experience in. It's really interesting. I, I was wondering. I have kind of a remedial question, I guess, around the the sequestration. It was really neat to see those slides and see what a big impact that sequestration had on the life cycle. Um, but I was sort of wondering, like, so is that is is that life cycle analysis measured on kind of an annual basis because I would imagine that you know the upstream nitrogen fertilizer production the, the transportation all of those things are happening kind of an equal level each year but sort of the net you know increase in carbon sequestration is going to start to reach some kind of plateau in a given system over time so does that start to shrink or yeah or how is that measured I guess yeah that's a good point so a lo like you said a lot of these inputs that we were looking at are annual measurements but with carbon sequestration, that happens on you know a much longer time scale, so decades even. And there's research coming out showing that the longer you farm organically, the, the more dramatic those changes are. So 
to answer your question or not answer it, I'm not sure. Um, I wasn't doing the modeling for that part, but please email me that question so that I can <coughs> answer it because that is a really good question. I'm, gonna, I'm taking notes. Were you suggesting that on some of those crops, uh, organic uh, production systems are actually carbon negative? And if so, uh, these are projections based on information from the database. That these aren't real field, real farming measurements that you're doing, is that correct? Yes, these are not real field measurements. This is all information from, um, from that EcoInvent database, which is basically com compilations of data from published studies. Um, and yes, in some cases, we do see that organic actually can be carbon negative, um, which is why I didn't show you the final comparison slide, because that's what everyone immediately zooms in on. But we're still working through all this data, and I don't want to put out a, uh, a I'll, I'll show you the graph. <laughs> all right, so yes, all of those bars that are below that zero line are carbon negative. So like I said, this is preliminary data. We are still looking into this um, because we don't want to make any statements that get torn up really easily. And this is not suspicious, but uh, we were surprised. So. Rodale had information about that years, several years. Yes, so Rodale, yeah, so this, this is similar to what Rodale found, but Rodale was talking a lot more about pasture in their study. So we're, we're still looking at this. I'm just going to move away from this. If you want to be very cautious. We're going to have to wrap up and save more questions for Jessica just in the interest of time for other speakers. But thank you so much for a very <laughs>